Welcome to the Flute 360 podcast, where we incorporate a panoramic view of flute-related topics. I am your host, Heidi K. Begay, and this is episode 71, NFA highlights from the William S. Haynes booth. Today's sponsor is brought to you by J&K Productions. Did you know that not only are they a production company for podcasts, but they are a recording company for musicians? Any musical recording needs that you may have, J&K Productions can fulfill that need. They have all the necessary equipment and expertise to record your next flute recording for college or graduate auditions, competitions, summer festivals, or a flute album. J&K Productions can record any setup imaginable, from solo flute, small chamber, flute and piano, and much more. Consider J&K Productions for your next recording project. Contact them at jkproductions.media. Hi, everyone. We are live at the National Flute Association in Salt Lake City, and I am here with the wonderful Amanda Harburg, who just received her doctorate, so Dr. Harburg. Thank you. And um, we are going to talk today about her NFA events, uh, Flute Speakeasy. Mm -hmm. Would you like to talk about that, Amanda? Sure. Thanks, Heidi. So the Flute Speakeasy is the brainchild of my colleague, Valerie Coleman, who uh, invited Nicole Chamberlain and me to create a workshop which is geared toward supporting flutists who are also composers. So we strive to give them a platform to showcase their works and to give them feedback on their works and recognition. And this is our inaugural workshop. And there's so much incredible community in this flute world. The the flute community we just find to be so energized with new music. And there's so much collaborative energy here and creative energy and we feel that it's important to give this new new opportunity for people to have creative compositional voices as well because we know that there's a lot of flutists out there who are also composing so yeah so we're this is the the very first workshop which will be this afternoon from 1 30 to 3 and we've got seven composers who will be showing their music and some really, really beautiful pieces, um, very contrasting pieces. And then we're going to take it on the road, so to speak, and uh, go around to different conventions this year. And we, we see it as sort of an ongoing process that people can, we just give people a chance to keep on um, showing their works and, and working on stuff that they can bring to us throughout the year. Um, and that's kind of the idea behind it. So, so we'll be around this year at, at conventions, and hopefully we'll get to meet a lot of new composers and exchange ideas. That's wonderful. Thank you. What a beautiful description. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, so you're collaborating with Valerie Coleman and Nicole Chamberlain, Mm -hmm. who are wonderful women and composers. Completely amazing, inspiring. And I think the three of us also are, we're having a really good time brainstorming this together. And we've been on many phone calls together, and we were just meeting this morning. And we're going to also be doing our own collaborating we're, we're really feeding off of each other's energy and it, it's a very we're we were just listening to each other's music and we're kind of inspiring each other in the process creatively and as performers yeah I can see that being a dynamic trio yes for sure quite yeah so you mentioned that you will be taking this on the road to other conventions yeah that's what's the, the idea. plan or what's um, the schedule like well we're we're putting out applications now, and we're seeing which ones, you know, we're, we're all busy composer performers um, with stuff in our own worlds that we're doing, but we're putting together a schedule now. We don't, it's not concrete yet, but we'll be announcing, we, we've got about four conventions so far, thereabouts, and there'll probably be more that we're, we're going we're gonna to go to this year, and 
great. Yeah. So you've had a busy year finishing your PhD. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you were mentioning some of your works that you completed this year. Could you uh-huh. share with the listeners sure. um, your year in summary and oh, what okay. you'd like to, sure. to showcase? Um, yeah, thanks, Heidi. Well, I, I worked very hard on my dissertation this year, which was about tone poems and how symphonic orchestral music adapts when there's a extra musical subject inspiring, drive, driving the musical form, and how different kinds of programs, be it painting or story or poem or environmental activism or how different uh, kinds of programs have different kinds of effects on the music and it was quite a year yeah <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of very late nights and very early mornings to get my dissertation done yeah. um, and then on top of that I also wrote my own tone poem um, for the Bay Atlantic Symphony commissioned by Bay Atlantic and conductor artistic director Jed Galen um, so that was a 12-minute orchestra piece that Bay Atlantic performed five times in May. And that was very exciting. They're a wonderful orchestra in New Jersey. Um, so that, that was a highlight of my year. And also, um, I had some, some major publications come out with Theater Presser Company. Um, <clears throat> my, my woodwind quintet, my suite for wind quintet, uh, was released just a couple of weeks ago. Um, very excited about that. Um, I feel that that is one of my strongest pieces. It was commissioned by the Dorian Wind Quintet in 2017, and the Aspen Wind Quintet will actually be uh, giving the NFA convention premiere tomorrow morning. Um, so that's pretty thrilling. And uh, it's now available with Presser. Um, and that was a big job to get that prepared. And yeah. a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of people spent a lot of time going through with proofing and details. And um, several quintets really helped me with the it was collaborative editing where people would spot something that I might have missed or that could be more detailed. Um, and it, it, it was a really in- incredible experience writing that piece and refining that piece big effort oh, wow. uh, and totally worthwhile thrilling effort and to see it in print is is really wonderful yeah to see like nothing and then the progress and the the process of the composition edits and then on page yes I'm sure that's very exhilarating it was funny when I first started the piece I was slightly terrified at the idea of writing a wind quintet it's a very huh. exposed medium very contrapuntal medium you can't hide behind the piano pedal you can't hide behind the shimmering string textures. The instruments are all s- sort of heterogeneous, and mm. then you've got this horn. What do you do with the horn yeah. in the middle of a bunch of woodwinds? <laughs> and, that darn horn. <laughs> and and it, it was tricky to sort of reconcile that. Um, and I actually wrote, like, two movements that I didn't even use. It, it took more time getting into the piece than it took to, re- to write the piece. Huh. And then when I actually got going... It was just so much fun, and yeah. I ended up, now it's like my favorite medium. Oh, neat! <laughs> Isn't that funny? And then, of course, the Dorian Quintet is phenomenal, and they oh, yeah. took it on the road and performed it a lot um, in 2017-18. They're still performing it a lot, and we recorded it um, last January, two Januarys ago. And... Um, so, so that that was one thing, and then the other major publication was my piccolo sonata. Yes. Um, so that that's all, those two pieces I feel like are my best pieces. Yeah. Um, and the the uh, the piccolo sonata, in a way that's very, it has an intimacy that um, speaks to me. And it was commissioned by Regina Helcher Yost. Uh, who also put together the Mike Maurer Piccolo Sonata Commission and, and others. And uh, she's a champion of, of uh, growing the piccolo repertoire. Um, she put together a consortium of 23 piccoloists. And she initially invited me to um, write a short piece for piano and piccolo. And as I got into it... Um, I was having so much fun with it, I wrote a, a full sonata. It wow. kept growing. First it was a five-minute piece, and then it was a sonatina, and it ended up as a 
is a full sonata. Oh, cool. So, um... Did you anticipate that, or did that just happen organically? It happened completely organically. And it's funny, the whole process that... When Regina first commissioned me, I hadn't planned to write for Piccolo, and I hadn't really entertained the idea. And at first, I I didn't know what I was going to do with it. It's so high. Mm -hmm. And... And then I got into the sound world of it, and I, I didn't have any ideas. And I sat down at the piano one day in the spring of 2018, and just uh, immediately came up with the opening section of the first movement. And I'm, I realized that this is a sonata form in the making, and and. I came up with some of my favorite material, really focused on the lower register of the instrument, mm. that magical, mystical, wooden-sounding, um, just, you know, Beauty. such a beautiful yeah. sound. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> That's so. neat. Is that what your compositional process is like in general? Like, you have an idea, and then you just let it form what it needs to be on its own or are there times when you're just like very matter of fact and mm. does that make sense yeah. like is your compositional process different from piece to piece or yeah. does it seem to be about the same no it's that's a great question um, yes it's different from every piece um, generally the materials have to determine the form okay and you, I can't assert my um, concepts onto the materials. I have to try to understand what they want to do. I see. So uh, it's a little scary <laughs> because if somebody asks me to write a certain piece, I'm like, okay, but then something else might come out ultimately. I see. But generally, people are pretty flexible. Yeah. <laughs> I try to stay within the general bar- ballpark. Okay. Um, but some pieces, um, it's very clear from the get-go that, oh, this wants to be an arc form with a clear-cut climax at the four-minute point that okay. then winds down to a soft, uh, solace-filled ending. Or some pieces want to have a foil and have a contrasting thematic section. Mm. and traditional development, which I, I like traditional form. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, yeah, so, it, and sometimes it's not evident and you have to sit with something for a long time before it becomes clear. Sometimes it's a real struggle and then other times it's not, mo- it's more clear. Mm. So yeah. I guess I'm always sort of seeking clarity and with the, with the process. Yeah. When I find the clarity, I know I've arrived at something that I'm going to keep. Oh, neat. I love that. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> and um, listening to some of your recordings on YouTube, mm-hmm. you are also a phenomenal pianist. Oh, thank you. Yeah, beautiful playing. <laughs> thank so you. So how do you juggle it all between being a mom, a composer, a pianist, um, a teacher? Mm-hmm. That's insane. <laughs> I mean, I think... I, I think a lot of us are doing that. And I think what I've heard some of my friends say who are in the same boat, mm. um, having kids forces you to prioritize your time more. Okay. And like I think I get more done now mm. that I'm really busy than I did bef- when I was younger in, in and sort 20s. of aimless in, yeah. in my 20s. Yeah. Um, but all of a sudden if you have an hour you're going to use that hour because you need it yep (laughs) so i I think i get a lot more writing done nice yeah and also as you get older you get more confident i think Hmm. and that also helps to be more productive interesting having kids sort of forces you in a way to get your act together because you have to it's no longer for yourself it's for somebody else true you have to take care of them and how can you take care of them if you're an insecure mess yeah (laughs) (laughs) love it that's great not that I was of course yeah no okay maybe a little bit (laughs) yeah (laughs) that's great I love that well thank you for sharing um is there anything that you want to share with the listeners um 
maybe aspiring composers out there who are young and getting their degrees, is there a piece of advice that you would hmm. like to offer them? Hmm. Keep writing. Don't worry about what others deem to be success. If you have creativity in you and a creative idea that you want to preserve, we all have creativity in us, but if you have, if you're really engaging with your creativity and trying to write music, if it's there, you're meant to do it. And just do it for yourself and the rest will fall into place. Yeah. That would be my advice. <laughs> How nice. What a great gold nugget. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Just keep at it and, and believe in yourself and it's not, the rest it's will follow. It's not about the yeah. worldly success. That cannot be your arbiter of success. Mm. I mean, the, the, uh, the trends ebb and flow. You know, yeah. and the the person, the 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 star of the day today yep. is is not. It's not about that. Yeah, it's about you developing your substantial self. Yeah, yeah, showing up over for the yourself. long term. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. and using music as that creative outlet yeah. to fulfill that inner need. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Nicely said. Yes. Yeah. Love it. Well, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Thank you, Do you have you, anything Heidi. else that you would like to um, add to our talk? Um, come to the flute speakeasy today. It's going to be really fun. Yeah. <laughs> and inspiring, I, I hope. <laughs> yeah. No, definitely. And there was a tribute to um, Catherine Hoover. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think we all were deeply touched by... Um, just the mark she left on all of us yes. in, our, in this musical community. Because yes. I did the same thing when I heard of her passing. She was a good friend of mine as well. Uh -huh. And um, I attributed a series of the podcast to her. Mm. And so to see how you ladies were influenced by her mark yes. and just the other people um, paying tribute to her, yes. it, it speaks highly of yes. her, her and her legacy. Her generosity and creativity is very much... Yeah part of why we're doing this workshop. Neat. Thank you, Amanda. <laughs> Thank and, you, Heidi. Yeah, have a great time at NFA. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. We are live at NFA in the beautiful city of Salt Lake City in Utah, and I am with my good friend Claire Howard, who we met through studies at Texas Tech University in Lubbock. And we have had the privilege to work and still work with uh, Lisa Garner Santa. Claire is a master's flute performance major, and she is a yoga teacher at the Highway 108 Yoga Studio in Lubbock. She is also the creator of Pry, which is practice room yoga. Welcome, Claire. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here chatting with my beautiful and so accomplished friend. Thank oh. you for having me. Oh, that's <laughs> too kind of you. Thank you. So um, tell us about what Pry is and how you were inspired to start such a project. Sure. Um, so Practice Room Yoga is a tool for musicians who are frequently, as a musician myself, I know that musicians are frequently broke and they frequently don't have a lot of time on their hands. So um, this was my offering to the music world, something um, that is free and accessible anywhere, um, that is brief and can be kind of a touchstone for musicians to use in the practice room um, to move their bodies, to quiet their minds, many meditations, many yoga flows. Um, I started practicing yoga as a little girl um, and I, I did it off and on throughout my childhood and my, uh, my adolescence and I got to my music education degree and I noticed how much my yoga practice was benefiting me um, as a flutist in terms of performance anxiety and recovery from performance related injuries and just body awareness in general. Um, and so I started wondering what I could offer. How could I offer this incredible tool to my super frazzled <laughs> friends in the music department who are like living off of ramen noodles and always freaking out about something because that's the nature of undergrad, right? Mm. I'm hoping that I'm not alone in that one, but um, 
So I decided to, to study a yoga teacher training at the Kripalu School in Massachusetts, and uh, it changed my life and the whole trajectory of my life. And um, Practice Room Yoga was born a couple years ago. I think it'll be two years ago almost, this wow. fall, which is wild. Um, and, and it's just a, a YouTube channel that is trying to make yoga accessible, trying to make movement and embodied performance accessible to musicians. Nice. And I do like how you mentioned how accessible it is, because as I'm scrolling through Instagram and I'm seeing posts about, oh, this or that, I see a post from Claire saying, breathe with me. <laughs> I'm like, yay! <laughs> I'm right. going to take a minute to breathe with my friend. This feels Aww. good. And so it is very accessible. Thank you. You know, so yeah. I think, um, and those little mini snippets yeah. are very tangible. And yes. like, okay, I can do this. Right. I have a minute. Right. Like 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. You can take a practice break. And I'm the kind of person who... Um, I feel very uh, valuable when I'm busy, which is not necessarily a great quality. Okay. Um, but for that reason, I tend to pack my life full of things that keep me busy all day. And then I'm like, wait, I, I haven't meditated today or done yoga. I guess I just won't do that. You know, or if someone says this could really help you in your life, maybe you should take up a breathing practice. I'll be like, oh, when, when am I going to do that? I don't even have time to eat. I don't even have time to practice. I don't have, you know, mm. um, so I wanted to, to make yoga really accessible to the busy musician and, and something that I could use in the practice room or I could be convinced to, <laughs> to take on to my daily schedule as well. Yeah. No, yeah. that's good. And, Thanks. you know, as we are taking breaks, say we practice 20 minutes on tone and we want to take a break. And what can we do during that break? Because teachers will say, make sure you take breaks. Well, right. like... I noticed, even before my studies with Lisa, yeah. my breaks were going to the phone. And uh, I noticed how silly that was because yeah. now I'm still in this, like, folding in position, looking right. down, tension. Right. But then, like, with this idea of let's utilize that break to maybe go the counter. Right. You know. Right. And um, I remember, it was it your second episode that you did a physical therapist and a good, flutist. Good, rem uh, good memory. The yeah. first one, actually. It was the first episode. Yeah, with Dr. Oh my Susan gosh. Fain. Yes. Which you interviewed. Yes. When I, was that interview? That was, um, I think it was my sophomore or my junior year of undergrad. So a few a few years ago, I did a, a roundtable discussion on wellness, and I it was published in um, the Flute View online yeah. magazine. And I it was so interesting to even scratch the surface of her knowledge. Mm. Um as a physical therapist and a flutist. I mean, she has a doctorate in both, which yes. is crazy yeah. and amazing. <laughs> um, but I remember that part of the conversation and it stuck with me. Mm. Like, I do the same thing where I'm like, oh, time to give my brain a break. Let me scroll. And yeah. I'm just, I'm still collapsing in my chest. Yep. And she was like, if anything, you need to take your hands to the left side, like the opposite of a flute, or you need to open across the chest. And so I try to do things like that now or like lay on my back with my legs up against the wall. Nice. I mean, if I'm, if I'm practicing at home, that's obviously accessible. When I'm in the <laughs> practice room at Texas Tech, no offense to Texas Tech, but sometimes the floors are a little questionable, so it's not always the best idea to do it there. But that was part of my inspiration for practice room yoga is that, like, not everybody's going to bring a yoga mat to their practice room. Not right. everyone has that luxury to practice in their house, and so how can I encourage movement opportunities for people who can't touch the ground, you know, they can't get down on their hands and knees and, and maybe they can't do a downward facing dog, but how can we still move in a way that's beneficial and, and encourages introspection and, mm. and checking in with your body? And I think if there was more of that in the field of music, more body awareness and thoughtfulness, we would have less injury, a lot less injury. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember reading a quote, I think it's by Benjamin Franklin, and he says something like, Prevention is the best medicine. Yeah. I mean, when I think about my injuries that are related to performance-related yeah. uh, injuries, um, you know, looking back in hindsight, it's like, why didn't somebody tell this to me? Because knowledge is power. Right. Right? And if somebody <laughs> yeah. would have just explained that your body's not a machine, yeah. Yeah. it needs to break, it needs to breathe, then I think a lot of my injuries that did occur could have been prevented. Yeah. You know, and yeah. thankfully now I, I'm feeling great. Good. And the minute I feel anything, I'm like, oh, and I'm aware and I notice instead of working through the pain. Right. You know, because I think in our culture, there's such a mentality of no pain, no gain. Yeah. Push, go, push, go, push, go, push. go, 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 go. Hustle, hustle. Yeah. yeah. And that's, <laughs> and I feel I've really, this summer has been an exploration for me with that in terms of anxiety and mental health. Okay. And I got to a really 
scary place last year, if I'm being honest. And yeah. I, um, I was just consumed by anxiety. And yeah. it turned into this weird, tiny depressive episode that scared me bad enough that I started seeing a therapist, which was one of the best decisions I've ever made. Um, but I realized that there was no preventative action happening in my life to help me stay in a focused and balanced place. Mm -hmm. It was all a, a giving of energy and all of a busyness and keeping myself going, going, going until the end of the day when I crash on the couch and then I just zone out and watch Netflix. There was no replenishing, no mm. like filling of my own cup. And so now I'm trying to, before the school year starts again, I'm trying to get into practices like Abhyanga, which is like an oil massage. It's mm. kind of like a self massage. It's oh. supposed to feel really healing and remind you like, okay, I am a physical body. I'm not just like a brain with legs, right? <laughs> like, um, I'm trying to get into a, to a journaling practice and a really restructure and refocus my daily meditation and pranayama practice. And I think that those things, if I plan on surviving the next year mm. of this degree, which yeah. is a wonderful degree. I love Dr. Garner. It's nothing about the degree itself. It's about willingness to, um, draw boundaries where I need to draw boundaries sure. and, and to take care of myself when I need to take care of myself and to not let myself be overextended. Um, it's, it's an important time for me to experiment with those things and act preventatively. Yeah. Um, because if I just keep going like I was going, I'm going to burn out. I'm going to explode. Like, <laughs> you and know, have a breakdown. Yeah. And yeah. have a breakdown. And I, I can't afford that. Nobody yeah. can. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. We're too busy to afford a breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> what do they say, like, you are no good to, you know, the people in your life if you aren't taken care of? Like, how can yeah. you give to your students and to your yoga uh, studio and um, your studies if you're not actually feeding yeah. yourself first? Because then you're just depleted. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not it's not the human experience to, to live so outside of our bodies, Interesting. Yeah. You know, I yeah. I was just journaling about this this morning, but you know, we're like an animal. Like mm. we're just animals, um, and we have these souls that get to inhabit these bodies and experience life in the physical realm. Mm -hmm. If you're, I mean, maybe I'm getting too hippie woo woo out there. I told Heidi I was going to get hippie woo woo because <laughs> that's no, the nature of, of my existence, I guess. But like, we're just these souls that are inhabiting these kind of like animal physical bodies experiencing the physical plane and so if I'm always living in my brain if I'm always living in analyt analytical like sensory overload mode then I'm not allowing myself to experience the fullness of humanness and to experience like pleasure and pain and sadness and disappointment and mm. if I'm pushing those feelings away pushing my physical experiences away so that I can analyze then I'm not I'm not in the fullness of my humanness okay so embracing it. Yeah. Yeah. I felt that in Romania. Like I felt disappointment. I felt anger towards myself because I didn't perform the way I wanted to. Mm. But I, there was a moment of clarity and I thought, this is beautiful to feel this. Yeah. I'm a human. Yeah. Yay. I'm going to, I'm just going to allow those feelings to just be because that meant that I put myself out there. Yes. I tried and the feeling disappointment was like, well, I would rather feel disappointment than just nothing at all. Yes. I don't know if that's kind of what you're saying. Yes, but that's, that's exactly how, what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. And I think yoga, if I'm looping it back around to yoga, yeah. I I learned a lot of that on the mat because we'll be in a difficult posture like warrior one or mm. ukatasana or something that's strenuous. And as the teacher, it's my job to remind students like this is intense and this might feel warm and this might feel, you know, mm. you might have increased uh, heart rate here or your breath might be faster and you can sit with that and yeah. you can you're going to survive this pose and you're going to feel oh. every feeling here and it's going to be intense for you maybe um, but then we're going to release the posture and, and then life. you're going to be okay on the other side and if we can sit with those feelings and really practice in the mat is like a laboratory for that you know you get okay. to move in and out of these places of intensity and ease and experiment with how willing you are to sit with those feelings of discomfort, sit with those feelings of ease, and then that somehow subconsciously can translate to being off the mat and, and getting a rejection or getting great news and, and saying to yourself, oh my gosh, this is my opportunity to sit with this. Mm. How does this feel? Can I, can I experience this without pushing it away or, or, or shoving it aside? Just like you were saying, I mean, yeah. it's, it's the beauty of being a human being as we get to experience. Yeah. 
Yeah, I learned a lot of that from yoga. And I went to my teacher training when I was 20. So I was really, okay. I was young to learn mm -hmm. those lessons. And I, like, it changed my life. It changed yeah. the whole way that I that I was moving through the world and that I wanted to interact with the world. Um, and I'm so lucky that I got to, to learn those lessons at 20 and mm -hmm. to digest them. I'm 25 now, so, like, to take five years to, to digest is has been really important for me. And even with that, I've still struggled with anxiety and still struggled with, you know, the ups and downs of life. Yeah. Um, so I can't imagine where I would be without, <laughs> without yeah. yoga. So, yeah. So what I'm hearing you say is because it has influenced you so much, you want to share that yes. love yes. and that experience to others to see if that could uh, essentially benefit them, you yeah. know, somebody yeah. else's life. Right. Yeah. And it's like there's this, like, well of blissfulness and, and peacefulness and authenticity and realness that lives inside of us and the five senses and the external world are always pulling us away 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 and the gift of yoga is is not anything that a teacher gives you it's a facilitation of allowing students to find that space again mm. and it, it's mm. you get to teach yourself really in a yoga practice um, I'm just offering weird physical positions that can help you find that space but the real gift is, is realizing that you have it and you all all along. Oh, yeah. neat. Yeah. So going yeah. to maybe a specific exercise that you offer through Pry, I remember an exercise using the piano bench. Yeah. And I love mm -hmm. that because, again, you mentioned earlier in the talk, what can I use in this space? Yeah. And those practice rooms have a piano bench. Yeah. 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 Can you remind the listeners like what that exercise looks like? Because I'm being very vague sure. right now. I think you might be talking about um, yoga to wind down. I have a video yes. that's a, it's like a chair yoga practice that can be done on a piano bench. But there are also a lot of really cool, like you can do cat and cow um, with the spine on a piano bench, putting your hands flat on the bench and then hinging from the hips to allow your spine to be parallel to the ground and then as you inhale find a smiley face shape with the spine taking heart forward tailbone lifts and as you exhale round rainbow shape with the spine taking shoulders forward uh, tailbone down yes. um, so that can be a cool movement on a piano bench I also this is going to be hard to describe I haven't put it in any of my videos yet but I am planning it one of these days uh, you can lay on your back on a piano bench get your whole torso tailbone through the crown of the head on the piano bench and then reach with your hands to see if you can touch your ankles oh. and if you can grab your ankles your feet will lift off of the ground right and it's just like this intense back bend you can even slide the head off of the edge of the piano bench and it can be a little <clears throat> a little difficult to get into and if somebody walked by your practice room they might think you're like <laughs> having an exorcism or something <laughs> oh no <laughs> but uh but it can it can be a really cool heart opener that is that kind of opposite shape. Yes. Um, so you're you're really broadening across the chest, and it's the opposite shape of the way that most of us practice flute most of the time. Yeah. Um, so there are so many options always. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So you do uh, regular updates yes. through Instagram. Yes. What other social media platforms do you use? So our Instagram is practiceroom.yoga. Um, I use YouTube for most of my, um, for all of my um, yoga videos. There are a couple IGTV videos on Instagram, and um, you can find us on YouTube with Practice Room Yoga. Um, I have a website, practiceroomyoga.net, that also has blog posts. Mm. And my newest, most favorite part of that is that um, I've recorded audio to all the blog posts. So you can listen to me read the blog post to you if maybe you're like driving in the car or you miss um, having someone read stories to you. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. If that might be soothing to you um, in your life, that's always an option. <laughs> um, and yeah, and email, you can always reach me at practiceroomyoga108 at gmail.com. Perfect. Yeah. Good. Is there anything that you would like to just share or provide an update to the listeners so that, I don't know, because you keep very busy. I mean, <laughs> I'm always seeing things pop up. I'm like, how does this girl have time? Oh, thank you. Because <laughs> it's, a, I mean, with both of our worlds, I mean, yeah. we have similar platforms. And I'm just thinking of, like, the technological side of things. Um, and I see how you share about, like, editing your videos. Videos. Yeah. What have you learned with like the computer side of things? Oh man. It, it takes up a lot of time. It takes up a lot of time. It's a yeah. lot. And and just like adding closed captioning to my videos has been my newest feat, my newest endeavor, and that has been interesting. Mm. And it's also very 
I, I, mean, I know you've transcribed your podcast episodes before, yeah. right? So do you notice habits in your speech patterns that then freak you out? Oh, yes. That has been really weird. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but iMovie has been um, an interesting trial. YouTube is its own beast. But I have to give a shout out to um, Nicole Ricardo, okay. who, who has an incredible Create Your Career um, course for musicians, and it's specifically designed to help you market yourself um, via email campaigns, via social media platforms, to create a brand that reflects you in an authentic way. And she and Taylor Rossi are two just really incredible marketing geniuses that I really look up to and have taught me so much about marketing on Instagram, about mm. branding myself. Mm. Um, and I would not be able to have a social media platform for Practice Room Yoga without having a mental breakdown if it weren't for the two of them. Wow. Um, they are really incredible resources. And both of their Instagrams always are featuring marketing tips or how can you interact better with your audience on Instagram and they, they give freely a lot of information but they yeah. also accept clients um, and they they teach courses so if anybody out there listening is interested mm -hmm. in learning more about marketing or just about themselves as a business owner because yeah. that's really what all of us end up being in the end you know as musicians is we have to own our own businesses and if you aren't going to teach um, with a with an institution of some sort um so much good information with them. Yeah. So I highly recommend them to anyone listening, for sure. And I like um, how, like, Nicole, here, her strength is um, sales and marketing and social media. Yeah. And how she can, and we all use our strengths yes. to help each other. Yeah. You know, and here yeah. she is saying, this is how to get your content out there. Yeah. And then you use those tools and your business is better for it. Yeah. And it's just this, I don't know, um, exchange. Yeah. It's really beautiful to see yeah. that in the community. Yeah. I think us flutists are um, a very special breed. Yeah, you know, we are. Yeah, we kind of um, catch each other and have each other's backs. Yeah, and it's nice to see that supportive uh, collaboration. Yeah, and yeah. I think we're also I call us like the hippiest of the <laughs> instrumentalists. Yeah, like I think we're the most willing to look outside of ourselves for like spiritual or movement practices that deepen our musicianship. I mean, of course I'm biased. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I've noticed that if you go to like a tuba conference, yeah. I don't really know how many yoga teachers will be there. True. But here at this, at this flute conference, I know of at least four. Nice. <laughs> you know, so, so I think that's an interesting and beautiful part of being a flutist as yeah. well. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Any thing else you want to add because what I've learned as a podcaster is sometimes I'm like and wrap and done and they're like but wait I want to mention blah 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 and I hate to cut you off oh, in no. any way I think that's all that I wanted to say and I'm just really impressed and grateful for this platform that that all the work that you have put in over the past year and a half to continue to facilitate a community for flutists to talk about what they love and to learn from each other Ooh. that is such a gift so thank you so oh, much thank yeah. you claire that means the world to me thank you have fun at the convention <laughs> thank you love you so much i'll see you in a few minutes <laughs> love you too girl hi everyone we are live here at NFA at the beautiful Salt Lake City uh, Flute Convention, and I am here with my great, wonderful, dearest friend, Spencer Hartman, who just received his DMA, so now I get to call him Dr. Spencer Hartman, although that feels a little weird, but mm. we all uh, did our DMA programs together, and so uh, because of going through that program, there's a special bond that I think you, me, and Sam... Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, have built over those three years. So congratulations on your oh, recent thank you very much. graduation. And I want to talk to you today about your dissertation and your research. So that way, um, this content can be heard and used to flutists like you. There's no reason for this great uh, information to sit on a shelf mm -hmm. and uh, collect cobwebs. Mm -hmm. So let's get your information out there so that way people can uh, apply it and make flute playing that much more um, enjoyable and yeah. beautiful. So what is the title of your dissertation? Well, the title of my dissertation is called The Flutist Palette, An Integrated Approach to Expanding Sonic Timbre Through Phonetics and Vocal Practices. And so this 
title, it's a little wordy and it could be a little confusing. So we're just going to kind of break it down. So I, I had a lot of experience in my musical training accompanying for vocal majors. Mm. And so I was really exposed to a lot of terminology and ideas that I felt as a pianist could, um, through hearing all of these vocal ideas, it could transfer over to my flute playing so seamlessly. And so working with this idea about vocal music, I kind of took it one step further and started finding a way to, to, to like accurately, succinctly discuss these ideas. Okay. And I found that using uh, the international phonetic alphabet mm. that the vocalists use throughout their whole like the college careers, mm. they learn how to uh, pronounce words through a, an alphabet that instead of, you know, creating a, a word in itself, it, each symbol represents a sound or a shape of the oral cavity. Okay. So what's happening with the tongue, the separation of the teeth, the location of the, the articulation that we're happening, that we're, you know, doing. So one of the biggest kind of ideas with this idea is the, uh, about placement and manner of articulation. So that's, you know, where we're placing the the action of articulation mm. in the mouth and then the manner and that's what action the tongue is actually doing mm. and um, and then so that's the consonant kind of idea the articulation idea and then there is the uh, the vowel idea so the vowel pretty much manipulates space in the mouth mm. through changing the the proportions of front mouth to back throat space okay. so you can use these proportions for no rhyme or reason but through experimentation to find you know different avenues of color variety that you didn't know you had mm. and then the third main aspect of this paper is you know resonance structures in the human body okay. so it's it's talking about obviously the most flexible is the mouth our oral cavity mm. because the tongue takes up very much of that space yeah. and it can come so far forward and so far retracted okay so this is a really big variable we have the nasal cavity mm. and i'm not necessarily talking about the nose and the sinuses here i'm more talking about the space that lies above the hard palate okay so and this is this space is it's not meant to fluctuate at all. It's mostly mm. supposed to be this cathedral of open space mm. that is simply just to exist, okay. right? And we, as long as we know that this space coming all the way back exists, mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, we can access it in some way just by visualizing it. Okay. You know, and then there's the final piece that we don't often think about, which is the pharynx. Okay. Right, and the pharynx has three parts: the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngeopharynx. Wow! And these spaces throughout the neck and head area, we can then manipulate to, you know, uh, and you know, not manipulate in a sense, but be aware of, mm. so that you know we're not doing extra work there sure. to grip or hold or. Yeah. You know, close we off or... We don't want that tension. Totally. Yeah. So I remember one of my teachers, Dr. Danette McDermott, she would have me to be aware of this resonance that you're talking about with the sinuses mm -hmm. from what I'm gathering is to kind of plug one nostril and then as you're inhaling through the other one, you're taking your hand to your cheek and you're oh. kind of pulling the skin up uh, with the cheekbone. Mm -hmm. Just to kind of like open up the sinus uh, airway and just to do that on the other side as well. Um, and I think she, you know, going into like the singer's mask. I don't know if I'm mm -hmm. saying that correctly. Yes, you are. Um, so that, that's what I heard through the, the content mm -hmm. you just provided. Mm -hmm. um, she would talk a lot about like the wasabi effect. And I think Emmanuel Pahu talks about this a lot. How you do wasabi and then like your whole nasal passageway just like you know like totally opens right. and is on fire um and i think it's uh, it's good to be aware of that mask and what the the face and the oral cavity can provide because it's another part of our body mm -hmm. for flute playing all and, of this yeah. information in the flutist palette is a variable okay, right yeah. none of it is supposed to be 
prescriptory in any way. Okay. Like, if you do X, you will get Z. Sure. You know, none of it is supposed to be like that in any way. It's supposed to be a, you know, a awareness. tool to help us gain awareness and flexibility and to, you know, create more intentional flutists okay. by creating, you know, basic ideas that we can think about from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And so from the personal performance standpoint, we kind of have that, mm -hmm. right? We're building the, the palette, the flutist palette. And then if we think of it from a pedagogical standpoint, we can use this kind of information to really accurately discuss these actions and processes mm -hmm. that happen in a, in a space that we can't see. Sure. Like I've sat through a lot of lessons where I've been like, well, where are you, where are you articulating? And people are just like, here. That, <laughs> yeah. And then they just like say, point to it, touch it and do crazy stuff, yeah. you know? And there is, you know, in phonetics, there, there are locations all throughout the hard palate and stuff, you know, that all have a, an effect okay. with the speech. Okay. Very mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. And I, I think it's interesting, this may seem a little off topic, but just, you know, seeing our friend's presentation mm -hmm. and him talking about his map and it's uh, Delcro's base. Um, and the, the one word that keeps coming out of that presentation for me is awareness, awareness of the movement, awareness of the body in it. And this is a part of that, I would think. Mm -hmm. Right? I, I absolutely agree with yeah. you. I think um, <laughs> once you understand the... So there's there's kind of a a little bit of a learning curve. Sure. IPA mm. is a little bit different than typical English because a lot of the letters that we use to write words in English aren't the letters that represent the sounds. Mm. So a big example here, and IPA symbols, they're represented in brackets, okay? Mm. So a lot of, like, you can write in brackets a specific vowel shape to kind of cue you to... Oh. What worked for you? Do you okay. know what I mean? Sure. So the the sound e, the long e sound is actually spelled with a lowercase i. Oh. In brackets. Okay. And this is just how you would write that sound in a, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. And so there's like the the pedagogy behind it. You know, it's uh, really helps with directed pedagogy. Like if you know what you want them to try, mm -hmm. and you know what the effects or yeah, the general, general yeah. what the effects could be. Okay. Then you can, you know, you could, as a teacher, then make the choice to prescribe a suggestion okay. for a vowel. Okay. And then knowing that there are all these vowels, then it also opens up the practice. Okay. Because right? now cool. you're like, well, I liked what that happened, but I maybe want to try a different vowel or, mm -hmm. you know, try different things. And once you find out, you know, once you really truly learn like what all the variations of the vowels are, and I think there's like 25 mm -hmm. different vowel okay. sounds in the main, you know, mm -hmm. four English uh, languages, the mm. four languages of diction coursework throughout undergraduate okay. vocal and I like how you're touching on the fact that you don't want to necessarily prescribe a certain, like, do this and then this will happen. Because as a teacher, what I'm hearing is then that is enabling my student to be his or her own best teacher mm -hmm. and giving them a toolbox, a palette to explore the possibilities mm -hmm. rather than being stuck, well, X will be Y and Y will be Z or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it gives you that freedom as an artist to be creative and mm -hmm. to use your ears right. and to listen, but you're giving them a guideline and saying, here, try this and then get creative and messy. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I, you love to get messy. <laughs> Taking us back. Taking us back to tech days. Yeah. Good old Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> Messy's love her. my middle name. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really cool. So does that kind of summarize the first portion of your dissertation so, well? Does this go into now the second section? So yeah, the first section is pretty much talking about the three main points. We have resonance, okay. vowel and consonant, okay. and this is our sound and articulation ideas. So then the second half of the, the dissertation incorporates um, exercises for exploration. Okay. So, uh, so I start with um, simply using vowel exploration, and this is, you know, without the flute. A okay. lot of these stuff, these ideas, because 
uh, we talk so fluidly every single day. We don't need the flute to work on these ideas to help translate into what we're doing behind the embouchure. Yeah. Uh, so I do lots of vowel exploration. And so uh, a really good kind of idea to try is if you close your teeth and go alternate back and forth between the vowel sounds E and U. Not with the lips. Not with the lips. Keep the lips out of it, because that's the embouchure, right? That can't mm, move. Okay. Well, everything's behind the embouchure. Mm -hmm. The tongue is quite movable. I mean, it's literally it's using the entire space. The entire space of yeah. the, your okay. mouth. So that movement, A, could help you with, I guess, it could be multi-affected. Multi mm -hmm. What's the word I'm looking for? Multi-purpose. Sure. I it like can it. be multi-purpose. You'll have yeah. it from a lot of Okay. Uh, so not only can we identify with the movement of the tongue during the switches okay. and what that does yeah. and how we could use that, that movement in flute playing, but then it also helps us become really comfortable with, the, with where the tongue sits in that vowel shape so we can constantly refer back to it. Okay. So then we add the flute. We work with it, all the different vowel sounds individually, and then we start alternating hmm. using your typical Moise long tone exercises, okay. you know, just like whole notes, chromatic, mm -hmm. and uh, go up and down. And then what's really interesting about these applications, I think, or what, what the, the bread and butter of the, uh, the application portion is, is what, what I call consonant and vowel cycling. Okay. So you start and you use long durations for each vowel. So let's say you'll hold your long tone per note 16 beats. And every four beats, you will switch the vowel. Okay. And so you'll switch the vowel on the fourth beat, and then you'll hold, and then until you, you go through whatever vowels you choose to do. Okay. And I would recommend, you know, starting in patterns first. Like, okay. use like E, E, U, E, E, and go back and forth between these vowels, cycling through them. Got it. When we speed it up to the quarter note, we're, 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 when we're changing the vowel shape on every beat, okay. I would recommend maybe something more fluid, where you're using crazy vowel shapes. Okay. Maybe ones that you wouldn't even use, huh. just to, you know... Explore. Explore, right? And so the cycling aspect, okay. I think, is so, just really fascinating, because that's when you truly hear what the effects are right. in the tone, right? And another thing to just be aware of is that all of this information and all of the effects are very, very subtle. Okay. Right? right. And so you kind of have to have an awareness of your own sound if you're going to, like, take to this to the practice room and do it yourself, okay. right? But if, you say you're a teacher for young students, I would even recommend getting this vocabulary into their heads young. So then that way we're discussing right. these things in a way that, you know... It's a part of their language. Part of their yeah. language, and it becomes second nature, and they talk about it like they talk in their everyday life. Yeah. So I'm thinking with exploring these different vowels, um, when you said the a, ah, e, u, u, is there, do you recommend like finding a bass sound? Like, I don't know, like, mm. you know what I mean? Like, can we find a foundation first? I mean, I mm -hmm. would think that would be important before changing all these colors. Yes. Right? I'm gonna, ooh, I'm gonna blow your mind. Okay, okay I'm so ready. <laughs> in my paper, yeah. which I, well, I can send you and you can... We can link it. Yeah, or you can just like take some of the images out. Okay. Uh, I ha vocalists use what's called the... the vow There's a couple things they use. And they're, I incorporated them both in my paper because they're for different levels of cognitive understanding, I think. Okay. Developmental stages, if you will. Okay. So the first kind of idea with the vowels is this idea of the the vowel diagram. So here we have our front vowels, middle vowels, and back vowels. So we're getting a little into everything here. So the, the front, middle, back refers to the location of the hump of the tongue. Got it. Right? And so we can move it really forward as an E. Mm -hmm. And it comes right up to the front of the, like right back behind the front teeth. Yep. Or we can go as far back as an aw, oh. which flattens the tongue kind of 
and opens the oral cavity. And yeah. So we have our high front vowel as that E and our low back vowel as the A, ah, right? And so in our middle vowel, mm. which is what... Is that what I'm talking about? Yes. Okay. There's only one, you see? Yes. So uh, this is what's called the wedge okay. in IPA terms or TP. People sometimes call it or carrot. And what this is, is the sound that is associated with the word mud. Mud. Uh, uh. It is the most neutral neutral tongue mouth position I think you could have. Interesting. For this. So it's mud. just like uh, 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 and then everything else is a, uh, a permutation of that. Sure. So the uh, I would say start there. You know, if that works for you, keep it. You okay. know, I wouldn't recommend doing something different if it's working. But then if you find you want something else, I would look at mm. this, maybe this chart okay. that will attach yeah. and use a, a closely adjacent vowel. Got it. Right? Yeah. And try that and be subtle at first. And then if you're still not getting what you want, go even farther away. I see. And so by placing the, the vowels on a, a three by three grid, it's kind of giving you a visual for the quadrants of the mouth. Got it. And then, you know, in all of these ways. So you can kind of imagine, what, visualize what the tongue is going to do yeah. when you're doing it, which also I think will help solidify the goal, yeah. the aim that we're going for. Mm. So once you're a little more advanced, there's vocalists use what's called the vowel quadrilateral. Whoa, that looks fancy. It is. <laughs> so what the vowel quadrilateral does, and it's an obtuse kind of shape, its obtuseness accounts for every conceivable boundary of the hump of the tongue. So we see that here, this E is way forward, way up in the high corner of the vowel quadrilateral. And A is way back. But here we have this little A and E sound. Okay. It's the sound that's in cat. Ah, ah. Okay. And so if we, um, ah, it's kind of front still, but lower, but behind E. That makes sense. Right? So yeah. you kind of have to like really experiment to, I would use this as a systematic approach, I think. I see, yeah. You know, kind of start here. Once that is working for you, start with, the, I mean, the three by three yeah. diagram. Once that's kind of working for you Explore and you want more. a little more subtleties, mm. then you can, you know, yeah, yeah. go with the vowel quadrilateral. And something that's really nice about the quadrilateral mm. that I think mm. is that with it on this kind of, it's on a, a landscape, a plane. Okay. On this plane, you know, you can use spaces in between the symbols. Oh, right? cool. Like, it's a spectrum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas the three-by-three three grid, right, it's, like, front high, and so it kind of just gives you the basic idea. Mm -hmm. But then when you're thinking about the quadrilateral and its boundaries, you can slide and move okay. in between them and make subtle nuances that yeah, yeah. could be what you want. So basically, it's, like, our three primary colors start there. Yeah. Is that red, blue, and yellow? Sure. Okay, that sounds right. <laughs> and then from <laughs> there you mix red and blue and you make purple. Yeah. And red and yellow make orange. Mm -hmm. But you have to have, that's I guess going back to what I had asked earlier, I would think having some kind of basis, which you described so, so well, is important. Mm -hmm. And then from there you can explore and then have all the nuances and the different colors and um, Variations. No, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Mm -hmm. So the third portion of your paper? So that so those are the two big portions. Two big portions. And okay. I think what's really I think another interesting piece about this paper in itself is the bibliography. I mean hmm. the resources that I painstakingly <laughs> scoured through, I mean, are not resources that the typical everyday flutist Wait. is going to have on their bookshelf. Sure. And there are a couple books that I can think of right away that would be a really great place to kind of just have these ideas explained by vocalists, which is always a different experience. Right. And so the one of them is uh, Julia David's and Scott Latour's book called Vocal Technique. And this is just, you know, it takes you through all of the fundamental ideas that go along with you know, how to sing properly, in quotations, you know, yeah, whatever yeah. properly means, yeah. or efficiently maybe, it might be a better word. Okay. How to sing efficiently while, you, you know, creating your most vibrant, beautiful sounds. Yeah. Another really great book that I um, 
found really fascinating was, it's called Introducing Phonetic Science mm. by Michael Ashby. And so what he does in this book that's really fascinating is he kind of has the science oh. behind what happens with our resonance structures, cool. like the, the science behind resonance. And he kind of really sums this up in easy to understand ideas that you can then re like relate to the flute. Mm -hmm. And then the third book that I think is just a really great go-to resource book for IPA mm. is the, uh, it's by Anna Wentlett. Okay. And it's called IPA Made Easy. And it comes in about like a four by six little book. Mm. And it's really thin, but each page has a IPA symbol in a big letter so you can see what it is. And then it will give you sample words from six main languages. Cool. So not only then you can like see what all of them are, okay. see if they work for you, mm. then you can culminate your own palette of vowels. Okay. Right? It doesn't have, like my flutist palette and yeah. your flutist palette are different. don't necessarily have to be the same. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then that just goes to the uniqueness of each individual player. Right. I mean, yeah. we're talking teeth length and width and height, Lit, and we're yeah. talking tongue fleshness and flesh uh, <laughs> sure. thickness and uh, its shortness. and Our skull. Our skull, our heads, our throats, right. our noses even. The fact that you're a man and I'm a woman. Totally. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very cool. Awesome. Yeah. It's a lot of information, <laughs> I know. And I think... No, it's great. I think... Once we, I'll put, the, I'll throw something together for okay. you that's kind of short yeah. and concise that you can just put up. How's that? That's great. I'll do it by the end of the week. Oh yeah, no rush. So for the listeners out there, if you are interested in gathering more information from uh, Spencer, where can people contact you? So my email address is spencerhartmanmusic at gmail.com. Okay. And... Uh, how do you spell your last name? H-A-R-T-M-A-N. Perfect. And um, do you have a social media platform that you post things on? Uh, I have a Facebook fan page and I have an Instagram page. And okay. I'm working on getting more active into those. <laughs> Grad school's hard. <laughs> well, post-graduation, yeah. now you'll have more time. I'm going to be a social butterfly now. <laughs> Go back to your roots. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know. Cool. So is there anything that you want to just add, throw in there that we might have uh, skipped? Because um, I've learned through podcasting how I can easily say, oh, that's a wrap. And then afterwards, my guest is like, oh, but wait, I forgot, blah, blah, blah. So I just want to give you a hot second to think about anything that we could have missed. I'm not really thinking of anything. I think yeah. I think the big the three big takeaways okay. are resonance yeah. and its structures okay. and the resonance spaces and what they their sizes and uh, flexibilities are. Okay. Right? I think that awareness of that is really important because that's the only way you can do something about it. Yeah. Awareness is the first step, right? Okay. And then vowel. Okay. So what the tongue is doing inside the mouth, and then its effect on the air before mm. it reaches the aperture. Got it. So how we're, how are we shaping the air with the tongue before it ever even has to be squeezed through our aperture? Yeah, yeah. Right? And then the consonants of day-to-day -day speech help us with articulation. Mm. So we, oh yeah, this is gonna be good. So uh, there's a couple big, big types of articulation that I, I talk about. Uh, big places, I guess they are. Mostly flutists deal with what's called a plosive consonant. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, where the tongue approaches a stationary object in the mouth, i.e. teeth, hard palate, what, what have you. Mm. And uh, there's, if we slow it down really dramatically, there's an approach, Okay. there's a hold, yes. and a release. Got it. Right? So the air kind of builds up on the hold, and when you release it, it goes through, and that kind of creates the articulation. Right. Right? So we have plosive consonants. These are really big in flute playing. It's like, mm -hmm. I would say, 80% of what we do yeah. all the time. Uh, so once we take the plosive consonant that we're using all the time, it's location. So mm. we have what's called a dental articulation, mm. and this is where the tongue comes in direct contact with the teeth. Got it. We have an alveolar. Okay articulation, 
which is where the tongue comes in contact with the alveolar ridge, which is kind of the bumpy part mm. on your roof of your mouth mm -hmm. before you get to the soft, the hard palate. Got it. The smooth, hard palate. Mm -hmm. And then we have what's called, I mean, for experimenting sake, I've included what's called the post-alveolar space. And this is almost a directly vertical articulation. Okay. And I mean, this is highly unusable okay. in flute playing, like the tongue up straight up, but I think ha being aware that the tongue can actually go there makes, you know, all of those spaces up until that point part of your arsenal. Right. And then we have what's called the Valor Strike. And this is the back strike of a, like a K. Okay. So pretty much when we're double tonguing, uh -huh. we're, we're alternating between dental or avular to this Valor. Like a seesaw. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I think knowing of these kinds of places, I mean, just really, really informs my students and myself. And uh, I like having control over specific nuances mm -hmm. through an action, right? Yeah, yeah. It's not like... Well, think just this. Just think this, right? Yeah. It's an action. It's a yeah. physical action that's manipulating what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Because you want, if you want to change in your sound, you have to change something physically mm -hmm. in order to create a mm -hmm. different sound Absolutely. that you are attempting. Because mm -hmm. if you're doing the, if you have the same makeup, well, nothing's really going to change. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it, we're. I'm trying to help create intentional. Mm -hmm. You know, deliberate. Yeah. Well learned, flutists. You know, I want people to have this grasp over they're playing like they have with their day-to-day -day speech you know sure. i think that's just sounds so beautiful to, to yeah. not get so caught up behind the whole fluting part of it yeah and make it more human make it more you know natural yeah 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 because it's not it's, playing the flute is not natural <laughs> right it's like asymmetrical <laughs> and it's putting a silver tube weird. up yeah. and holding out yeah. to the side is not natural no. what yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I think this kind of brings the human aspect kind of back into flute playing, mm -hmm. which I think is really, we're not even, maybe not back into it, but maybe brings it to it in general. You know, I think it's, I think it is very beneficial information in the studio and in the practice room. And I, my students have just, you know, kind of taken to it and it's changed the way I think about, mm. well, the flute and singing, a lot of different avenues yeah. in my life. I mean, it. Yeah, just yeah. being a musician, mm -hmm. being a creator. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'm hearing too is just like that organicness and just remembering we're human mm -hmm. and we have all these possibilities that our body can allow for us. And we're not a machine, we're not a computer. And that's what's so beautiful hearing one player to the next. Mm -hmm. Truly. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's why every, and then it's, yeah. I mean, yeah, and then we need to try and dissect why or how, <laughs> you know, I think that's the next step. I would yeah. love to, I think, do some further research working with, you know, ultrasonic imagery and stuff where yeah. we can have, you know, mm. real pictures of what's happening. Yeah, and, that'd be cool. Yeah, and I would love to get, you know, some abdominal support kind of ideas working on okay. in there. Like, what is support? Mm -hmm. Support's different for a lot of different instruments, I think. It's yeah, yeah. You know, some people, some instruments support so much differently than others, I think, because you have to. And yeah. Yeah, so I think that would be a nice next step to kind of get into. And oh, cool. Further research. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Keep updated with Spencer mm -hmm. for, yeah. <laughs> for future updates. Sounds great. Well, thank you for sharing Absolutely. your content and your research. And I know for fellow researchers out there, they can really, um, you know, we can thank each other for putting in uh, their dedicated time and countless hours into a subject um, that doesn't get sometimes a lot of recognition in the beginning. And then mm -hmm. throughout your career, we're like, oh, you know, and we see the longevity of it. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you for late nights in the small study carol at Texas Tech Library. My and pleasure. <laughs> I've been there and mm -hmm. we've all been there in some uh, regard. It's, yeah, it's a price you pay for bettering yourself as a human musician flutist. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for inviting me here, Heidi. This Any, was some fun. Anytime. Yeah. Have a fun time at the convention. Mm, you too. 
everyone. We are here live at the NFA Flutes Convention in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I am here with the wonderful, energetic, <laughs> captivating Dr. Oh, Erica Boyson. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> Already, I met Erica like five minutes ago. I feel like I've known her my whole life, oh, and yes. her energy is just like oh, you're contagious. So <laughs> well, like I said, this, you know, the Haynes Oasis over here yeah. with a little palm tree and we got some snacks and I'm sipping on some cold brew, which is really helping. Yeah. It's probably like also helping with the, the energy that you're feeling. So. Yeah. It's the shot times two. Times yeah. two. That's an important number. Yeah. You won't be able to sleep tonight. Exactly. <laughs> Insomnia will kick in. Oh, uh, no kidding. Oh, shoot. Oh, well. <laughs> So not only are you a Haynes artist, yes. but you are the flute professor at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. Correct. Yes. Yes. And you had an NFA event today. I did. Yeah. Tell us about that. The title. How did it go? What was the turnout like? Yeah. Uh, elevator pitch. Oh, it was exciting. Oh, elevator pitch. <laughs> I always, I'm always... How long is an elevator pitch? I, I have know. debates about this. Because mm, how like, long do you ride an elevator? It depends on how many floors there are. Ooh, very good. You know, is it like 15 seconds or? Depends on the, okay. the, the, the <laughs> if it's a skyscraper or two floors. We're, gonna, we're just going to pull the emergency right now okay. and press pause <laughs> on the elevator. Okay. Okay. So um, the event yeah. was entitled Wonder Woman, colon, Celebrating Her Strength through music and it, it was really special yeah. also because so we um, all the performers got there and we were just having fun catching up old friends people that you knew for on, on social media but hadn't met in person mm -hmm. and and it was it, it was it was a, a great group of people and then all of a sudden someone tapped us on the shoulder and was like uh concert's supposed to start in like two minutes and we're like oh crap okay <laughs> so um, the whole program it, uh, was uh, works by women composers, and um, the vast majority of the performers were women. There were um, mm. two pianists that were uh, men, but uh, in the piece I got to, the two pieces that I performed, the first one um, was di by a dear friend, uh, Natalie Washam mm. of 8th Blackbird and Flutronics. Um, played uh, her solo piece for flute, uh, amplified flute and electronics, and it features her voice, her gorgeous voice, mm. uh, entitled Wander. Mm. Um, so I got to share some of uh, Natalie's music with the audience, which is always fun. And then the program ended with the, the famous Nicole Chamberlain, uh, her trio Percolate with Kelly Sulik and Lindsay Leach Sparks. And mm. that's so fun. You get like lots of w wonderful, you know, slobber all over your flute with all that, you know, like yeah. all, the, all the pizzicato yeah. stuff and it's stomping and that's, it was super fun. Yeah. So if you guys don't know that piece or both of those pieces, check them out. Nice. They're awesome. I remember when I was learning Nicole Chamberlain's Whale for flute and trombone. Oh. That there's a lot of spitting and, you know, all this. And I remember envisioning giving a future lesson to this future student saying, if you're not, like, slobbering, you're, you're not, not doing it right. You're not putting enough <laughs> air and spit out there. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's so That's true. what that reminds me of. <laughs> you get out the swab for the inside of your flute and the outside of your flute. Yeah. And your mouth a little bit, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Have a little hanky ready to go. <laughs> nice. Well, it sounds like it was a great event. It was. Was and, it a good turnout? It was a good turnout. Good. And, and that's, and I mean, that's the joy of these conventions, right? It's reconnecting with people you've known since, I mean, my, my very first flute teacher and the person I credit, you know, to the reason why I'm playing the flute today, Kim, Kimberly Helton, she was there and her whole family was there, you know, and I, I mean, I, she knew me when I was like eight years old and then Aww. some of my students were there. And so the connection that happens afterwards and yeah. getting to, you know, meet new people. And so that's always a highlight too. Seeing that family flute tree yes. right in front of your eyes. Oh my gosh. Yeah, the, yeah it's, it's very, very special. There's mm. a lot to celebrate over the course of these four days, you know? Yeah. And that's definitely one of them. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Just even when you said, you know, my first flute teacher since you were eight, I mean, even in passing, going up the escalator, yeah. and I see my one of my very first flute teachers, Diane Boyd Schultz, yes. who teaches in Alabama. I didn't even get to say hi to her, but just that, oh, that, no you know, you just, you feel that 
that warmth and yeah and, and gratitude and and yeah. you know I mean to, to me this whole convention is about sharing right yeah whether it's sharing new music sharing uh, um, you know your, ideas. your network your ideas yeah and and I mean at times I've caught myself and this is only day one you know just sitting in the audience just feeling overwhelmed with this is just that's really true. beautiful what we get to do and the people that I'm surrounded by and hmm. kind of the messages that we we put out there. So yeah. I'm in a really kind of euphoric state today. Nice. I just, it's, it's been a really great day. And I think a lot of that were just the people that I got to reconnect with or meet today. And Yeah. So or, or the people maybe who aren't here, but, you know, we're playing their music. So they're here in spirit. And sure. Yeah, Which very is a true. large part, part of it as well, you know. Yeah, that's yeah. beautifully said. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. 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 So what was your academic uh, year like this past uh, yeah. 2018 and 2019? The 2018, 2019. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, summer does something weird to my brain. <laughs> it's only been two or three months since the school year ended, and it feels so far away. Yeah. Um, but what are some highlights from this last year? I guess most immediately I'm thinking of our flute fest that we, we host Ooh. at UNCG. And actually, Natalie Yoasham was our guest artist, and she... Um, yeah, she inspired a lot of people in the Greensboro area just by her personhood, mm. but also by her music and just who she is and her interesting um, kind of path uh, through education and then into her professional life. Um, what else? I've, for me personally, um, there was a lot of fun travels and performances uh, with um, a chamber group of mine, the Four Corners Ensemble. We played in New York and um, went to China, mm. um, and we went to um, Connecticut um, with my students. I mean, it's hard to even recount, you know, all the highlights with my students. Oh, sure. I, I, oh, I mean, yeah. it's it's kind of a thing. You know, I, I, I'm just kind of in a happy place today talking about how wonderful the convention is, but also just the privilege of my job and getting to work with these individuals. Um, yeah. Last year was around 18 individuals and getting to work with them one-on-one -on -one mm. and, and seeing their growth and, you know, putting together their goals and then helping them achieve it each and every semester and seeing them, you know, put themselves out there and put themselves in vulnerable positions and, yeah. and really learn a lot from them. So, hmm. I mean, highlights would include... I mean, really any of their recitals, studio recitals, anytime, you know, in a lesson yeah. where a student not only, you know, had a breakthrough, but also, you know, a, a one of those lessons where it felt like a, a heartbreak, where I'm, 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 I'm stuck. I, yeah. I don't really know what I'm doing. What do I want to do in the future? I mean, these are all questions and these are all moments that, yeah. to me, kind of over the course of the year make it really substantial okay yeah and going forward into next year um i just met with my dma student my ta student and we um jillian story little shout out to jillian <laughs> and um something i like to do is always have these special projects each year okay. or each semester so that we're you know we're, we're covering a lot of the fundamentals and doing a, a lot of the same things um similarly each semester whether that's you know a specific uh for instance like semesterly uh, studio recitals or mm. our studio classes or you know memorization projects stuff like that but um, we're trying to come up with new and different things to, to exercise other of these um, supplemental skills that are kind of required of a musician okay um, entrepreneurial perhaps perhaps yeah, yeah. so and, and this can range from a variety of things right um, one semester we uh, worked on mindfulness and meditation nice. and um, making a commitment to every time before we pull out our flute our flute would be a reminder to you know sit mm -hmm. for at least five minutes mm -hmm. just with our breath um, just to see you know over the course of a couple of weeks you know what changes would occur um, we, uh, let's see here, we've done uh, other projects that we're, we're coming up with for this next fall. Um, we're, we're calling it uh, Fit to Flute. So each week we're going to be doing something outside of just playing the flute. So whether nice. that's going on a hike nice. or whether that's, you know, doing a Zumba class as a studio. Yeah. You know, these other ways of cultivating these, these skills of whether it's, um, endurance, right? Mm -hmm. Or a mindset of, oh my gosh, 
my, my brain is, you know, my body is really sore, but I can I do four more sit-ups or whatever, you know, mm. it's how much of we can um, translate that into into our instrument and practicing. Sure. Um, let's see here, we're, we're excited about a kind of upcoming guest artists to host this next year cool. that will be announced in, in more public form, um, kind of the beginning of the school year. Nice little um, teaser there. Yeah, <laughs> so stay tuned on the UNCG Flute Studio Facebook page. Nice. Um, yeah, so those are kind of the, the, the things that are coming to, yeah, the four when, mm-hmm. and when asked about highlights about last year and this upcoming year. That's great. Yeah. A lot to be thankful for I and agree. a lot to look forward to. And I can just see, um, since this is only audio, the listeners can't see the visualization, but Erica's face is lighting oh, up. Sweet. And since you I got so excited, um, just your body language when you said my job and my students. Yeah. Can I be a little selfish and ask, because there's a lot of DMA recent graduates, colleagues and friends, yeah. and just like the job application process, because it's so competitive. Mm-hmm. And um, I know you're working towards, uh, did we say associate? You're working. Correct. Yeah. yeah so gone. you know what mm-hmm. that paperwork and the process is yeah. like. So what if you had like one piece of advice for somebody going through the job application process, absolutely. What would it be? So I think I think this is something to even think about, even as a master student or, yeah, kind of an upper classman in undergrad, yeah. thinking in these entrepreneurial ways of okay. of you know what what sets me apart. Okay, right. So it's required that everyone is a master on their instrument, right? right? That you play in time, you play in tune, and you play with a great sound, and you and you really offer something with your music. Okay. But beyond that alone isn't sufficient. Okay. You know, what what else what else sets you apart? Okay. Right? It, and it could be your interests. It could be um, other skills such as um, you know what? I really like um, working with audio, right? Mm. I have really great skills with working with technology and manipulating audio or being really creative with different samples or mm. it could be I really love nature and and understanding, you know, how sounds in nature can relate to what I do on the flute. I mean, really, it's, it's, you know, so often when I was a student, um, I was a little bit more nervous about the things that set me apart, Mm. right? The things that made me a bit more different from the other people on the right and left-hand side of me. And I wish I would have gone back and um, really nurtured those things. I see. So thinking from an earlier stage, right? Yeah. What... Why should we hire you? Yeah, yeah. And um, in comparison to the other two finalists. Right. And being able to talk about that. Yeah, your right? uniqueness. Right. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And so being comfortable with that. And then, you know, as you're, and, and that starts when you, when you begin your DMA. I mean, obviously, that's, as, as a terminal degree, there's a lot that goes into that. Yeah, yeah. But as you think about that research project, I mean, that DMA is, a, is all about gaining experiences. Mm. It's about, you know, getting um, a nice collection um, or additions to your, your networks. Yeah. Um, and it's also about, I mean, those universities or conservatories or wherever you go to school mm-hmm. are, have incredible resources for you to use yeah. um, to, to release help you with your projects, your, Mm. you know, things that really uh, set you off in terms of your curiosity or things that you want to know more about. Yeah. Um, So digging into that earlier rather than later. Okay. Just thinking also, not just as a recent graduate, but also as a teacher. Yeah. Like how to equip our students. Absolutely. With those skills earlier on rather than later. So thank you for letting me pick your brain on that topic. But it's um, it's good to get insight from many walks of life just so you have um, a toolbox. Absolutely. And you have those resources. Oh, gosh, yeah. yeah. And, and that's a, a lot of, you know, thank you for providing this resource oh. and making, you know, the fact that, you know, you, you said that you interviewed five people today. I yeah. mean, to think about just the wealth of information. Mm-hmm. I don't even know. I assume other people talk about similar things. Yeah. You know, and just getting to click and you can scroll and maybe, you know, someone goes off on a tangent, just get to hear the different perspectives and and nuggets of advice. 
yeah. and, and, and people's, you know, maybe while you're driving your car or walking your dog or making coffee. I mean, yeah. it's, it's really exciting. So thank you for what you're doing. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a need to collaborate. And I, I learned so much from you all. Um, and even like my listeners, they'll email me and say, hey, have you considered this topic? I'm like, mm. oh, okay. Or even like in September, I'm going to do a whole series with Robert Dick. And mm. he reached out and said, I want to talk about extended techniques and how it can help our practice with the traditional oh, repertoire. Cool. Yeah. I'm like, oh, cool. And so it's, it's interesting, like um, us being creators of, you know, projects um, outside of our flute. And I think that kind of taps into what you're saying earlier, like what is your niche? Yeah. Um, that once you start a project, sometimes like it just transforms and, and it goes off on this organic path and you're like oh I did not expect totally for it to go that way but I'm glad it did because yeah. it turned out better than I had hoped exactly you know? and being aware you know when those when those signs appear like for instance I'm trying to think of when that would have happened for me I guess so for instance okay I, I grew up um, in the playhouse actually was more of a singer and an actor than a flutist, right? Wow. And then I kind of put that away because, you know, I'm going to school for yes, flute performance. Yes. But then I, I went to a school where there was a lot going on in theater and, and all that, and, and I saw someone who had kind of put a little bit more... Um, uh, Theatrics? Um, yeah, in? into their performance. Okay. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, where? this, I got to yeah. do this. Yes. Who is this person? How do, how do I get involved? And, you know, in, in really paying attention to those people or those things or those concerts or, or whatever that really set you off and going yeah. towards that, right? And yeah. being aware of those signs and, and really making sure that you're seeing them and you're nurturing them, mm. right? Instead of like, no, I need to be <laughs> staying focused in this way. I mean, we do need to stay focused, yeah. but being aware of... Um, you know, what other things may grab your attention is important. That resonates so much with me. Before I was a flutist, I was a ballerina. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and I actually um, had to stop because I had an injury. Mm. Um, but life is funny and it flutes, you know, yes. was the next path that opened up. And you're right, like, you know, I hear you know, Heidi from two years old to 14 was a ballerina. Right. You know, then 13 to whatever is a flutist. And for some reason, my brain boxed it. Yeah. And I never even thought that my ballet experience could help me being a flutist. Or, yeah, you're just still very much a ballerina. I mean, those yeah. that decade and two years yeah. still very much informs you as a person today, you know, and as a flutist yeah. and as a as an interviewee or yeah. viewer, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, and then, you know, I just cut that off I cut that you know that foundation or my past life away and then when I realized oh wait like I'm not being very fluid with my movements on stage or whatever mm. and then I realized like what you said you saw that theatrics flutist and you're like wait a second I know this yeah and you know being introduced to you know uh, specific flute teachers along my path and and talk about movement and things like that I'm like right. wait I know <laughs> movement I'm a ballerina exactly and like, Duh. but um, I think whatever path or um, yeah, path you come from, use those experiences to help nurture oh, completely. what you're working on as a musician, Absolutely. for sure. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. You're a ballerina. Yeah. <laughs> and even, you know, the that resonates with me, too, on a different level with, like, Carol Winsense. Mm -hmm. She talks about all the time how, like, theater yeah, is in her past. And when you watch her teach, it is all theatrics. Like, you watch her eyes and her mouth and her gestures. It's like, whoa. Yeah, and I, and I think it's important to also acknowledge that, yes, I'm a flutist. Yeah. But... But on top of that, I, I need to also be a teacher, right? Yeah. I need to be an orator. Yes. I need to I need to be very in tune with my movements because it's not like people sit in the audience and then close their eyes or cover their eyes. True. You know, yeah. I need to be someone that engages the audience. Mm. I need to see myself, you know, like or a faci facilitator or a community builder. These these titles that we put on ourselves. Sure. You know, even like on a CV, Erica Moisson, I think right now it's a like interdisciplinary collaborator, flutist and educator. I mean, come on. <laughs> I, I really, it, it, the, that list should go on because hey. it, what we do requires so much more than that. Yeah. We're storytellers. Yes. We're, 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 um, you know, advocates. <laughs> yeah, all these things. Yeah. You know, and, and that's and that's what's required in, in this yeah. field. So, so you know, getting involved in those other ways and stretching, you know, whether it's singing or dancing or w any any of those things that I just listed that terrifies you. Yeah, you yeah. Know, um, improvisation used to do that for me. I used to make up any type of excuse to like not go brush my cat's hair or something. <laughs> 
but I should lean into that, you okay. know? Yeah, yeah. It, because I, at some point, and guess what? At some point, I did have to y- utilize improv- improvisational skills. Okay. You know, because yeah, yeah. that's that's what's required today. Yeah, you know? exactly. And it goes back to what I said that, you know, pl- being a master on the instrument is required. Yeah, yeah. But in and of itself, it, it is not sufficient. You know, there's yeah. all these other things that we need to be cultivating within ourselves. Right. Yeah. And I think it's just, too, to help our students um, get their job um, in whatever capacity that is. Not everyone's going to be a soloist on stage right. touring. Like right. a, like a pop hood. And that, I mean... And that's I, a great I, thing. It's a great thing. We, we need other types of, you know... Right, uh, exactly. Musicians and artists and, yeah, and educators. educators and yeah. conductors and music therapists. And, you know, the list goes on and on and yeah. on. Yeah, definitely. So then as you as a university professor, if you can dabble and you understand and see the whole, Mm -hmm. you know, circle, bird's eye view, then you can direct them. And you might not be the actual, like, maybe expert in music therapy, Mm -hmm. but you can say, I know enough and I know these people. Here are the resources. Now let's go. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in, in, you know, kind of piggybacking off of that, I think this is my plug for music education. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because I think going into music okay. is one of the most effective or immediate ways of, of cultivating certain skills that are required of any profession, right? Whether that's work ethic, whether that's accountability, whether that's setting goals and making sure you're achieving them, whether that's working well in groups, whether that's, you know, any and, and what other degree on campus at a university um, do you get to meet one-on-one with a mentor? Right. Yeah. Every week, Very at least true. once a week. Right. Where, you know, and, and yes, we talk a lot about flute and lessons, but there's a lot of other things that come up, oh, right? Sure. And flute is kind of a conduit for building a lot of these other skills. Okay. And so it, it's, to me, that's that's the merit of music education. There's mm. a lot of other things that go on besides, oh, your A was a little flat. <laughs> Let's talk about all the different ways we can bring up the pitch without pulling, you know, pushing your head joint in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see, um, yeah. I kind of went off on a tangent there. No, it's good. That's one of those things that I feel really, really passionate about. Yeah. Uh, Because, you know, because not everyone is going to be making their their primary income from... Yeah, soloing. From, from, yeah, Yeah. playing playing their flute and only their flute in in a solo capacity of some way. So understanding how you can utilize that in a variety of ways. Right. And having the conversation of other types of careers out there, right? right? Whether it is things that are outside of orchestra and Mm -hmm. the academic position Mm -hmm. because there's a lot of other ways of kind of weaving a a tapestry of happiness and quote-unquote success with music and and performance and education and and all in collaboration Mm. um, within your life. No, that's beautiful. Yeah, Yeah, I believe in that very wholeheartedly. I'm glad we got on the topic because yes. this, <laughs> this is what this is all about. It's like, you know, finding your passion yeah. and putting it out there so people listening can be like, yes, yes, yes. I, you know, Absolutely. I don't know. And just feel like they're on board and yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's and cool. people should also know that I, I, yeah, never mind. We're probably running out of time, aren't we? Oh. <laughs> I could, these are, these are topics that I, you know, can go long and long about. about yeah. But. Anyway. Well, well, one of the things I have learned through podcasting is I usually say, okay, that's a wrap. And then afterwards, the guest goes, bye. Oh, wait, wait. No, wait I have to put thing in. Yeah. So my lesson <laughs> I've learned through this year journey is, is there anything that oh. you want to share, shout out, a summary, last whatever, yeah. so you don't feel like you were gypped? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! Kind of last statements, or a pick, um, or even like a pick. Like I don't know your favorite chip brand <laughs> or <laughs> chip brand. I don't know. That was very random. Are, but you, are you needing some chips right yeah, now? Yeah, I'm craving salt right now. <laughs> <laughs> Probably dehydrated. It's super dry here. Yeah, it is. Um, okay, closing thoughts. And I think this is probably just something that, um, based on our just most immediate conversation, um, I. I want to put it out there that there's lots of, it, 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 literally something that I just kind of mentioned, there's a lot of different meanings of success in this field. Okay. And that, um, you know, just 
these certain jobs, whether it's in the orchestra or if it's in academia or, or in anything else, mm -hmm. you know, that there's a lot of other ways of building a meaningful career in music. Mm. And I'm really excited about having more of those types of conversations about how students can kind of cultivate that yeah. and making sure that um, other people who are, you know, building that meaningful career outside of these institutions, mm -hmm. um, how they're doing that so other people can be inspired by that. Mm. Um, in addition, I... I'm trying to think of my favorite chip band. <laughs> Sun chips, Sun Doritos. Chip. You know, I just oh, this is this is something fun. Yeah. <laughs> so I got here. I'm only remembering this because I when I first got here, what was it on Tuesday? Mm. I was so hungry. Okay, and my <laughs> hotel wasn't ready. I was like, I'm gonna go to Whole Foods. It's only two miles away. I can get. It's a grocery store. I can get all these things from my hotel room, and I can just veg. Veg, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I start walking, and. Okay, if anyone who is going to visit Salt Lake City in the near future, <laughs> yeah. it's very hot and dry here. So two, two miles feels more like 20 miles in 95 degree heat. So, and I had my flute on my back and it, it, it was like half mile in and oh. I was like, I'm not going to make it. Oh no. I was like, okay, what are, what are my, uh, what are um. some other options? And everywhere there's all these, yeah, right, I could stick up my thumb. <laughs> <laughs> Probably could find another flute as fellow flutist. Yeah. But there's all those, you know, the scooters, the green, the lime yes. scooters, the bird scooters. Have you ever? No. Like, well, I, I refuse because I don't have very good balance. Okay. And I'm afraid that I'm yes. going to like just topple okay. over. Totally. So we have a lot of these in Greensboro and I'm always thinking, oh my gosh, this looks so dangerous. But I was like, this will get me there twice as fast. So I found some shade underneath the tree and I downloaded my, you know, lime scooter thing. And I, and I, I scooter to Whole Foods nice. and I survived to tell the tale. Good job. But I would like to warn people <laughs> that it's something to maybe practice before you go like on the street. Oh, it's because yeah. it is, I'm sorry, but it's very, it, it's really, the balance thing is very um, real. It's a thing. It's yeah. a thing. <laughs> and wear a helmet and practice in a, maybe a parking lot. I don't know. That probably doesn't sound safe either. Practice on your driveway. Or... Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So that's my fun fact. Okay. I rode his lime scooter for the first time two days ago. And you live to tell I the love tale. To tell the tale. <laughs> With the backpack and your flute, oh, everything. Yes. You're brave. I'm brave. I'm so. I would be so afraid of like ruining my flute. Well, there was that. That's a good point. Yeah. That reminds me one time. I have never shared this story before, but I'm feeling very vulnerable and Let's comfortable. Do it. do it. Right here, right now. August 1st. Okay. It's probably past 530 and the convention 529. is... 529. Oh my gosh. 60 seconds. Yes. It's your elevator pitch. <laughs> my, I, it was my first year of my master's and I was in Louisiana working with Dr. Danette McDermott uh -huh. and I was going off to orchestra practice and I wanted to make a shortcut. I was on my bike. I didn't own a car. Because it was, do you buy a flute or a car? <laughs> and I bought a flute. It's a smart choice. So I did not have it's a better car. better for the environment. Yes. yes. Less carbon. My carbon print is small. Yeah. So I rode my bike, and I wanted to take a shortcut because I didn't want to go all the way around. Yes. To the yeah. So I saw this grassy hill, and I thought, oh, I'm in shape. I run. I can yes. do this. Well, the hill was steeper. Then I thought it was. Okay. I started going up, started going up, and I'm like, oh no, oh no, oh no. Do, 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 do. <laughs> oh no. I Wait, what about the flute? Was the flute, flute on? The flute's fine. Oh, good. Flute's okay. fine. My knee, my oh. sign, my. I was, oh no. I, I, yeah. I should have asked first about I, how no, you were doing it at your flute. I'm but sorry. You're, no, you're a flutist at heart. You have to make <laughs> sure that the instrument's okay. But I just had a laugh. At first, I was like, you know, there are tears. I'm like, ooh, 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 I can't oh. go to orchestra like this. And then I'm like walking my bike. I'm like, and then you can start laughing at yep. yourself. But I'm like, oh my gosh, what were you thinking? Wait, so, did, anyone, did anyone see you? Because sometimes, oh, well, they're closing was, up the lights. It was right. Oh, oh. You know how funny that is when you fall, <laughs> and then all of a sudden you're like, wait, did anybody see that? And oh. you're like, oh my gosh, that was funny. I am fine. Well, the thing was, it was on the side of like the busiest highway in Natchitoches. Oh, no. So I'm pretty sure there were like a million people who saw me, but it was Louisiana. That was 2000. Seven, so that was a long time ago. <laughs> but, but you, but you recovered. Yeah. See, you, were you wearing a helmet? No. Oh, okay. No, see, but I was but, okay. I mean, okay. it wasn't like a mountain. It was That's a true. hill, That's but true. Okay. it was it was a learning experience, just for like perception of like depth of things and the. <laughs> and think about all the things you learned. I know. In retrospect. Yeah. Don't take shortcuts. Don't take shortcuts. Yeah, it's okay to go the long way. It might take a little longer, it is. but it'll pay off so you don't get scraped up. There you go. Yeah. Always wear a helmet. Make sure that food's okay. <laughs> so
so yeah, yes. I haven't. Yeah, there's probably other things in there too, but they closed off the lights. <laughs> They're showing. I mean, they shut down the light, or they turned off. That's that's how you shut turn turned. <laughs> They're like dimmed. Eric and Heidi, shut it down. <laughs> turn off live on air light. There's a light right here that's like and, and off. Where yeah, this one I have to actually. Oh, yeah. there you go. We are officially. And that's a wrap. <laughs> Oh, this was so much fun. So much. It's so great to meet you, Heidi. Yeah, Thanks for the, the laughs. Thanks for letting me pick your brain oh, and yes. for the Thanks chuckles. For the, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the great questions. Yeah. Sure. So I look forward to checking you out on all your social mm-hmm. media. Mm-hmm. Heidi K, is it Big A? Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. And you can find her on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and in, um, it, LinkedIn. Sh- li- oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay. Just said in Spotify. I don't know what that is. That's podcast. That's yeah. spot. Uh huh. I don't so know that, what those other that's ones okay. are. That's okay. Uh, that's Podbean, oh. YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, Radio Ditcher? Public, Stitcher. St- I never heard of Stitcher. Yeah, yeah. Radio Pub. Never heard of Radio yeah. Pub. Yeah, and then uh, Spotify. Spotify. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know about half these either. This but is you, a great fire. Thank you. You, you learn as you go. <laughs> Well, awesome. thank you, Erica. Oh, yes. Yeah. So and you great are to meet delight. you. Oh, you are a delight. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Today's sponsor is brought to you by J&K Productions. Did you know that not only are they a production company for podcasts, but they are a recording company for musicians? Any musical recording needs that you may have, J&K Productions can fulfill that need. They have all the necessary equipment and expertise to record your next flute recording for college or graduate auditions, competitions, summer festivals, or a flute album. J&K Productions can record any setup imaginable, from solo flute, small chamber, flute and piano, and much more. Consider J&K Productions for your next recording project. Contact them at jkproductions.media. Thank you for listening to the Flute 360 podcast. For more information, please visit HeidiKBegay.com. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review in the iTunes store. Let's talk about flute.